to join us. Excuse me, I got a prompt that came up, but um, we're so glad y'all could join us for today's event. So welcome to the Together We Will Heal Forum organized by the Central Texas African-American Family Support Conference. The conference's vision is to educate the African-American community on mental health, substance use disorder, and intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as the total well-being of African-Americans. We hope this forum will provide the opportunity for you to participate in conversations that offer education, encouragement, and resources. So now we're gonna go over the housekeeping rules briefly. <clears throat> so one, please mute yourselves at all times. There'll be time for interaction. This is number two. You may use, excuse me, you may raise your virtual hand then and unmute yourself to talk when you are called. Three, type your questions in the chat. Number four, if you get emotional or overwhelmed, please turn off your video so you may handle your emotions privately. Number five, note that the session will be recorded and it is streaming live on Facebook. So smile. So our conversation today is titled All in the Family, Navigating Neurodiversity and Nurturing All. My name is Juana Akbon and I'm a community health worker with Integral Care. My role includes providing outreach in the community in addition to carrying a caseload for service coordination. With me today is Kimberly Mosley. She's an educator, advocate, and the founder of the Mosaic Path. Welcome everyone, let's start. remembers the show all in the family take a look at these questions that are scrolling for you and let me see if this will help to jog your memory from television city in hollywood boy the way glenn miller played songs that made the hit parade guys like us we had it made those were the days. And to do when you were there. Dance for girls and men, woman. Mr. We could use a man like Hybrid Hoover again. Didn't need no welfare state. Everybody pulled his weight. GRO was sour and great. Those were the My, what a voice. <laughs> Edith Bunker, what a voice. So if you are familiar with the show, perhaps you have some interesting answers to the questions. If you're not familiar with the show, I bet you your mom, your grandmother, someone in your family um, that's over the age of 40 or 50 <laughs> will likely be familiar with this show. I am using this show to help us to get into the mind frame for this session because all in the family, it embodies the concept that most families, I dare to say all families are diverse, meaning that the members of the families have distinct personalities, we're going beyond their physical appearance, but even that is diverse. So we will be talking today about the differences that exist within our families and how to navigate it to ensure that we are recognizing and nurturing everyone. So I would love to see your interaction in the chat as you consider these questions. What do you remember about the characters on the show, if you're familiar? And do you think that things have progressed since the 70s and how we view differences? Keep the, the conversation going in the chat, feel free. And we're gonna keep moving. Oh, you probably wanna know something about me because I am your navigational guide for this session. 
you will see information about me scrolling down. Um, again, my name is Kimberly Mosley. I am a current PhD student and I study educational psychology concepts, specifically neurodiversity amongst families. I am especially interested in how neurodiversity impacts underrepresented families, such as African Americans or Black families. So I am always overjoyed when I have the chance to present to this wonderful group with the Central Texas African American Family Support Conference. I want to say thank you again for having me today. All right, so what are our goals for today? We have four main goals. Participants will examine diverse family structures. So we'll be talking about our family members <laughs> in our own personal families and making note of their unique qualities. Next, we will identify neurodiversity. Participants will learn about common characteristics associated with autism spectrum disorder or ASD and giftedness. And sometimes I will speak about giftedness and I may say GT, which stands for gifted and talented, okay? We will also prioritize children's perspectives. Participants will hear from my own children and will learn the importance of incorporating all perspectives. And finally, participants will develop plans to meet diverse needs. Participants will gain resources and hope to assist with meeting the needs of all children in the family. Because remember, it's all in the family. That's our focus today. Because family relationships matter. It's a rare condition this day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page. Love and tradition of the grand design, some people say, is even harder to find. Oh, were you dancing? <laughs> I loved the show Family Matters, and I hope that it brought back sweet memories for you. But even beyond that, I really want you to walk away today understanding that family relationships they really do matter. And you can see on the screen that we have three relationships that we tend to think about, um, but today we're gonna focus in on two of them. So the parent-parent relationship, this is an important aspect of the family. To put it simply, strong marriages and strong parental relationships equate to strong children. When parents are happy and working together for the betterment of their children, families are stronger, all members of the family. And this is the same with the parent-child relationship. Yep, you guessed it. Healthy parent, healthy children. There is a strong correlation that exists between a parent's psychological well-being and a child's developmental and mental health outcome. This is proven by research and it's backed by statistics, which are derived from the empirical research that is conducted. And at the end of the presentation, you will see um, a list of references and there are specific references that speak to the stats and the information that I'm giving to you during this presentation. Those references will be available at the end. And last but certainly not least, we have the sibling relationship because healthy sibling relationships equal healthy individual children. So within the sibling group, if that sibling relationship is healthy, so two sisters, they have a healthy relationship, then sister A will be a healthy individual more likely and sister B will also be healthy individually and that's very important because siblings they are very close but as they grow they tend to have different interests and they may even separate one may go off to college one may get married etc cetera, etc cetera. 
So we need them to be healthy together and individually. Siblings are the first example of a best friend for many. Efforts to support sibling understanding and strengthen sibling bonding will yield positive results for all children within diverse family structures. And that's really our focus, all in the family. We don't wanna leave anyone behind. So parents have a big job here. We must manage diversity that is inherent in the uniqueness of our children. Parents and other caregivers are the ultimate life navigators, okay? So this picture here shows my four little babies and they were visiting a pumpkin patch. And when you look at the picture, just like my children, they are different sizes. You know, you see my, my oldest daughter and then my second oldest, who is my other daughter, and then her brother right behind her. <laughs> and then you see the baby brother, okay? So just like the pumpkins, some are small, some are large, some are elongated, some are more wide, but they all are growing in this patch, okay? So when we think about a family and what it takes to nurture that family, think about vegetation growing. Certain plants, they need a, more sunlight than others. Some can thrive with no little to no sunlight at all. Certain plants need more water on a daily basis or more frequently, I should say, than others. Some can thrive with little to no water. They can grow in the desert. So I hope that I'm helping you to see that navigating neurodiversity is sort of like growing plants. We have to give each individual child what they need specifically for their special, unique identities. And we cannot get lost in a child who may have special needs and forget another child that may be more independent. This is what we're gonna be talking about today. We have to balance as we're navigating, we must balance so that all children are nurtured. This session will focus on siblings and the parent-child relationship. There must be some magic clue inside these gentle all I see is a tower of dreams, real love bursting out of every scene. As days go by, it's the bigger love of the family. Yeah, you guys know I had to finish the song out. <laughs> family Matters. We will focus on the sibling relationship and the relationship of the parent and child as a support for the sibling relationship. So the parent is going to help to support that healthy relationship amongst the siblings. That's our focus today. There must be some magic clue inside this gentle world. I love that song so much. I had to let it play again. <laughs> All right, so here are some examples of what's all in my family. These are some of the attributes that are embedded in the Mosley family. We have math geniuses and precocious readers. We have a child who's on the autism spectrum, curious children, scientists, chefs, chess players, master readers, one um, who needs a little, who in the past needed a little help in math and has grown into a math genius. Um, some who were just naturally math geniuses. A child who has been identified as gifted. Um, a child with apraxia of speech. You guys can read them, but an animal lover, sensory seeker, adventure seeker, independent, strong-willed. Our family is very diverse. And that means my husband and I have our hands full, making sure that we cater to the needs of all of our children. So I love to learn about your family. What are some attributes embedded in your family? Please feel free to share in the chat. 
We want to know what's all in your family. Do you have an artist in your family? Hmm. What about an avid reader? I look forward to seeing what you share about your family in the chat. Oh, I know these cubes <laughs> that are sharing all of our family attributes. They resemble a dice. However, life is not a game. Navigating a neurodiverse family can feel like rolling the dice and just hanging on and trying to survive from day to day. It's like we roll the dice and the number that comes up on the top, that's the number that we deal with. But this cannot be so because there are still other numbers on the cube. We must make sure that we are addressing all the needs in our family. I have a question for you guys. How do you feel managing the diverse needs of your family on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, I can answer the question for myself. It's overwhelming. <laughs> it's overwhelming because there are so many different needs. Um, but I want to know, how do you guys feel? Drop it in the chat. So our aim today is to share strategies that will lessen the feeling of dice rolling and increase a sense of support and guidance. We are navigating neurodiversity and nurturing all. So I think a great place for us to go to next is to hear from the mouth of those who matter the most, in my opinion, and that's the children. So here is a video that was produced by my children. I hope you guys enjoy it. from the children. How does it feel as an older sibling interacting with your younger siblings? How does it feel to interact with my siblings is that um, it's kind of entertaining and interesting. For me, interacting with my younger siblings, sometimes it's entertaining like my sister said, but me being the oldest, it's kind of annoying sometimes. So can you tell me from your perspective, how is it having a sibling on the autism spectrum and a sibling that's gifted? How it feels to have a sibling on an autism scale is that it feels interesting because you get to like learn um, how to help them. How it feels to have a gifted sibling is that, let's take music for an example. I have a sibling named Robin and she's really good at the trumpet. Um, what's good about using music is that she knows the notes and it can like put in the mood of the of what I'm feeling, what she's feeling sometimes. Um, but then it's kind of loud and it's kind of annoying because she plays it when she's bored. It feels happy. Sometimes it feels mad. I feel happy, excited. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, surprise. What I worry about having a sibling with autism is that when they grow up, I'm kind of worried that um, something bad will happen to them because they have autism. One of my worries are uh, when he goes to like middle school or high school, that he'll get bullied and it might go too far just because he's different. As old people say, presentation. <laughs> The following clips are things that Ryan does on a day-to-day -day basis. So guys, we're out now. It's the morning and we are about to eat breakfast. Hey. What do you want to tell me? When Ryan is trying to tell me something, sometimes he will tap gently, repeatedly on my shoulder and that gives me a signal that he wants to tell me something. Ryan is enjoying the car ride. What do you want, Ryan? Again? See? 
So guys, this is how Randy communicates. Sometimes he like talks. Okay. And the other times he does it on his talker, but he mostly, you know, screams him. This is how he works his talker. He presses on these buttons that have words on it and he puts them in a sentence basically and there's a voice that when you click on the buttons there's a voice that says a word. How was your day? Huh? How was your day at school? One thing that Ryan does is kind of strange but unique is he takes these random utensils and then he like lets them drop on the desk and it's satisfying for him. I just want to share this quick message to you guys. Siblings are just like an elevator. If someone goes down, help that person to go up. If someone goes up, they help you go up with them. Y'all are all a team. Y'all be there for each other. That's what I call family love. I would like to thank Interval Care for letting us do this video. Oh. They did such a great job. I am proud of you, Robin, Caitlin, Ryan, and Colin. That was a great way to show us your perspective. <clears throat> so how can we ensure proper balance while navigating neurodiversity? As you can see with my family, I have a lot to balance a lot of distinct personalities and needs. Uh-oh, excuse me, I skipped a slide. So parental support for diverse children. Um, this is not all <laughs> of parental support, but I wanted to ensure that I highlight four areas that I think are great ways that we can provide support for our, our diverse children. The first one being through modeling. Parents must not only speak, but they must show children how to include others and interact. Through education, making children aware of autism and giftedness and their character, excuse me, and their characteristics will increase empathy and understanding amongst siblings. Interaction encouragement. Neurodiverse children must be encouraged to interact at times. Children with ASD and giftedness, they often struggle socially. They may withdraw. So there are, um, they may need a little extra push to interact. And their siblings may need help with how to initiate or encourage interaction with their sibling that may have a neurodiverse condition. Finally, space and opportunity, because children benefit when parents provide ample space and opportunity for them to practice interacting and bonding in spite of their differences. So what that means is after the modeling and the education and the encouragement, parents need to allow children to be children. It's amazing what they can do on their own when we're not butting it. No, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm also being serious. Give them that space and opportunity. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the next slides. So modeling is one of the main ways that children learn. They watch you and then they mimic what you do. So one of the best ways to teach children to interact well is to model how to do so. Here you see my youngest son, Colin. He's driving a car and he's modeling what he sees his mommy and his daddy do when we drive our cars. <laughs> so modeling is very important. So let's take, for example, if you have a child on the autism spectrum that struggles with communication, your other children need to see you as the parent working through those struggles with your child. If it means being patient, if it means um, providing an alternative form of communication for that child. 
this has to be modeled so that your other children will know how to interact with their neurodiverse sibling. Next, we have education. Now, this comes to no surprise, but children are always watching and listening. So even if you don't think you're teaching them, oh, yes, you are, you're teaching them by what you say and what you do, even when you don't think they hear you or see you. So it's important to utilize each and every moment to educate children on neuro neurodiversity and encourage tolerance and appreciation of differences. So an example that I'm thinking of is if you're out at a restaurant <clears throat> and your children notice someone moving their hands around a lot to speak, they're using sign language, um, you can discreetly but intentionally explain to your child that that is a completely normal way to communicate. That person who's using sign language may have a hearing challenge and it has affected the way that they speak verbally, but they are able to communicate in a unique, cool way. So speaking to your kids about the differences that you see as you're out and about is a great way to educate them. Don't just stare and just eh, brush it off. No, take that moment to educate your children. It will help them with understanding others who may be different. So speaking of education, let's dive into a little bit of education ourselves. Um, let's define autism or ASD. It is a developmental disability described by a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. What about giftedness? According to the National Association of Gifted Children, um, because there's a lot of definitions of giftedness, just like autism is on a spectrum, giftedness is also very diverse. So I decided to pull the definition from the National Association of Gifted Children, but understand that this is simply one definition, just to give us an idea and to frame these terms that we're using today. Giftedness refers to students, children, or youth who give evidence of high achievement capability in such areas as intellectual, creative, artistic, or leadership capacity or in specific academic fields and who need services or activities not ordinarily provided by the school in order to fully develop those capabilities. All right. So if you've ever attended a um, former talk with me, then you have heard of the CRIES program before. CRIES is an acronym, a trademark, um, copyright protected acronym that I developed to help people understand neurodiversity. Don't ignore the silent cries. Don't ignore the silent cries. So when we're talking about autism, CRIES stands for communication, repetitive behaviors, information processing, emotional regulation, and sensory sensitivities. This is a quick way for people to kind of, if you notice someone who's different and they're doing something that doesn't quite sit right with you, or you're thinking, why is that child doing that? maybe you could think about the CRIES program and ask yourself, okay, could there be a communication challenge going on? Oh, are those repetitive behaviors, spinning things, um, using pencils and crayons to stem like Ryan was doing in the video? Could it be information processing? Could it be emotional regulation? Could it be sensory seeking? And then it will help to frame your thoughts lower your frustration or and your stress and help you to relate to the person. This is my hope and my research 
that I'm doing for my PhD program is centered around seeing how this program can help families and providers help everyone to be more understanding of individuals with neurodiversity. So let me pause it. This is my son, Ryan, demonstrating for you how he communicates an alternative way for him to communicate. Remember with the CRIES program, the C is for communication. Let's check Ryan in the box. Oh, I just love that video. Ryan, he works very hard to communicate. He does use an AAC device in addition to his own voice just to assist with other people being able to understand him. But as you notice in the video, he said blue, he said purple, he said yellow. He was actually saying full sentences, that is purple. You know, so his AAC device is just to supplement his voice is what I like to say. But I'm wondering, I would love to hear from you in the chat. What do you notice about Ryan? And what do you notice about his therapist? So you may have noticed that Ryan is very calm, cool, he's poised, he's confident, he knows what he's doing and he's using whatever he has to use to communicate. His therapist is also calm. She is reinforcing, she's encouraging. So these are things that we wanna make sure that we are doing as parents when we are interacting with our neurodiverse family members. I'm also curious if any of you can relate to my son's experience, or do you have anyone in your family who can relate? All right, let's jump to GT or gifted and talented characteristics. And I also have a CRIES program that I would like to dive deeper into research to see how this can help families of gifted children cries don't ignore the silent cries when we're talking about gifted children the c stands for curious and creative the r for reading i independence e emotionality and s social skills these are five areas that are very common characteristics of individuals who are gifted I hear you. That's why this little clip example of how it is raising a gifted child. And again, we're focusing in on the C for curious and creative. You can also take a look at the questions over to the side as you watch. Do you ever wonder what it's like to raise a superhero? Put it back right now. How do you give him a normal childhood? Mm -mm. No. Good job, bring it up. Bring it up. How do you protect him from the world? Come here, Dion. Ah! Dion, I'm not playing. Well, let me tell you how I raised my son, Dion. There we go. You ready to eat it? Fruit from the blue. <laughs> First, never take your eyes off of him. His powers can be unpredictable. Uh -uh. Dion, put the iPad back. How did you know? 
This is day number one of filling Dion Do Things That Boggle the Mind. I needed a sidekick to help me film. And for me, it was my late husband's best friend, Pat. Go scare Pat. Jeez. Oh, man. Keeping track of him <laughs> won't be easy. Dion, you better not be naked out there again. Because he's always going to be thinking one step ahead. How come my poop isn't invisible? How come your poop isn't invisible? Oh, my, my, my. The questions they ask. <laughs> All right. So I hope you're sharing your thoughts in the chat. What do you notice about Dion? What do you notice about his mom? Can you relate to his experience? I sure can. <laughs> All right. So that was our education segment. Now let's move to interaction encouragement. Children with ASD and giftedness must be encouraged to interact with diverse groups of people. Oftentimes those with ASD and giftedness need additional encouragement to do so. Like I said, um, and like you saw in the CRIES little acronym, um, social interaction is a challenge for both individuals with ASD and individuals with giftedness. And we're gonna touch just briefly on the fact that those two groups are not far apart from each other. <laughs> um, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of children on the autism spectrum are also gifted. We call that twice exceptional or 2E. So that's another area that I'm very interested in. I don't wanna go off on a tangent, but that is a very interesting area for me. So just know that sometimes the interaction has to be encouraged so that our neurodiverse children, no one's feeling left out. Remember, it's all in the family. So we wanna nurture everyone, even if we have to push a little bit and encourage that interaction. And finally, we wanna make sure that we're giving space and opportunity. Sibling relationships thrive when children with diverse skills and perspectives are allowed to experience life free from the influence of their parents within reason. <laughs> These moments form bonds and deepen understanding of strengths and unique attributes. So parents, it's okay. Allow your children, your siblings to be siblings. And trust me, they'll call for you if they need you. Mom, they don't have a problem calling for you. <laughs> But that space and opportunity is important, and it's an important part of nurturing the sibling bond. So here are some quick additional considerations. So remember I told you about the twice exceptionality. It is true that there are children who are on the spectrum, and they are also gifted. And so a lot of times, one of the conditions will mask the other but a good parent and good advocacy will be able to make sure that that child is receiving services and support for any condition, any form of neurodiversity that may be present. Also, there are diagnostic and treatment disparities that exist specifically amongst underrepresented groups. So we have to make sure that we're considering that as well. Resource inequities. Oh, certain communities are 50 plus miles away from various treatment centers and therapy options and resources. Um, and we're talking about socioeconomic resources, but also a school district can be considered a resource. So there are a lot of inequities that I am working hard and tirelessly to make sure that I close those gaps so that all families have a chance at nurturing their children. All families deserve that. Neurotypical siblings may be reluctant to share feelings. They may not want to feel like they're a burden to their parents. So it's important that parents encourage the sharing of perspective, like my children did in the video. Of they want you want to make sure that you're encouraging it from all members of the family. Also, as a community, 
we want to be sensitive to neurodiverse families. They deal with a lot of hidden challenges like balancing so much, family, work, school, therapy, doctor's appointments, other activities. And so we want to make sure that when we are dealing with families that we know have a child that may have a neurodiverse condition, just keep that in mind and use a little extra kindness because it really is a heavy load. Families with diverse racial and cultural backgrounds also experience additional stressors that must be considered. And social and emotional learning supports can be beneficial for parents and children. So this is an SEL or social and emotional strategy that I love to use. It's called pizza breathing. And so everybody loves pizza, right? So you cup your hands <clears throat> and you in front of you and you pretend you breathe in through your nose, pretending that you're inhaling a warm slice of pizza and you breathe out through your mouth like you're cooling the pizza off. This helps children and adults practice breathing to calm down. Social and emotional learning increases calmness and emotional regulation. And this can support siblings as they're bonding and interacting together, specifically when they're is a neurodiverse dynamic working in the family. It may cause that child to become frustrated or the siblings to become frustrated. So it's a good idea to have an SEL or social and emotional learning strategy on deck to model for your children, educate them, encourage them to do it together. So now what you're seeing on your screen, I'm going to start showing you a, a various resources for neurodiverse families, okay? So we just spoke about the SEL implementation, social and emotional learning, and pizza breathing is what we were talking about. So I put that on the list, the first one, right? A developmental pediatrician. Oh, this is a very, very important part of your team for neurodiverse families because official diagnoses are required for most, if not all, um, therapies to be approved by insurance. And the developmental pediatrician is going to be the person who's going to help you get that official diagnosis most of the time, I believe all of the time. So developmental pediatrician is important. Your local libraries, they have many programs, reading, story times, and activities that are tailored to neurodiverse minds. And if they don't, you can advocate in your community and ask for programs. Your school district. I know that we all um, have different experiences with school districts. Some are better than others. Still, your school district is a great resource. You may have to pull to get <laughs> what you need from the resource. You may have to fight for it, but the school district is a wonderful resource. Chuck E. Cheese. In my area, they have Sensory Sundays. That's a resource for neurodiverse families. Let's check out some more. Your local universities, your police departments, community centers, community colleges, other families, other families. Oh, that is like a gold mine for neurodiverse families to find another neurodiverse family and they can share their resources with you. They can also make you feel like you're not alone. That is a priceless resource. Let's see some more. Here are some more. Um, Odyssey of the Mind. I was a member of Odyssey of the Mind myself um, and I loved it. So I had to put that resource on there. Hoagie's Gifted Education. It's a website with resources and I have the links here. I can drop these links in the chat during our question and answer session. And if any of these resources, if anyone needs me to go back through these, I'm happy to do so. Please ask me during the Q&A. All right, I think I have one more page of resources. Yep. So I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So I put Paul Quinn. Um, college because I know they have a summer program for gifted students and Paul Quinn is an HBCU 
So a historically black college and university. So I put that on the list. We see some other options here for you. If you'd like further information, please ask during the Q&A. Oh, I thought that was the last page. I have another page. Resources are just flying everywhere and that's good. Autism Speaks, the Autism Society, Child Mind, the Mosaic Path. That's my organization. I am a resource for neurodiverse families. I'm proud to be. And any help that I can offer in gifted testing guidance, SPED advocacy, just please, my husband and I would be honored to help. My husband is a master social worker um, and he loves what he does. So together we are honored to help neurodiverse families. So supporting neurodiverse families will increase awareness, increase social and emotional learning, shift negative perceptions. This is very important because a lot of times when people think about neurodiversity, they think about dysfunction, something that needs to be fixed, helped. But my goal and a big focus of my research is to shift this negative perception to something that is beautiful. There is beauty in uniqueness, and we want people to embrace neurodiversity. So supporting neurodiverse families will help with the shift. And finally, it will yield positive outcomes for all. Remember, all in the family. We don't want anyone to be left behind. And all family members benefit from a sense of belonging and respect for their differences and the uniqueness of others. It is my hope that you feel better equipped to navigate your unique life experience. Thank you so much. Enjoy life's journey. And remember, you can navigate whatever road your family travels upon. Embrace the diversity and enjoy the ride. Hey, by the way, do you need a co-navigator to ride along with you? you can call on me. I'm always down for a road trip. Navigating neurodiversity, it's, it's a challenge, but I, want, I don't want anyone to feel that you're ever alone. On your screen, you will see some areas that you can contact me if you need support. IEP planning, goal review, that's important. Pre preparation for your ARD meeting. Art support during the meeting, talking about it after the meeting, gifted testing, grievance support, due process hearing, TEA reporting, letter drafting, resource guidance, community partnerships. I have walked through it and I'm still walking through it. So I'm happy to help. Please reach out to me. Here is how you can find me. This is my contact information. I will also drop it in the chat. I have enjoyed spending this time with all of you, all of you navigators, neurodiversity navigators. Here are my references. And now I look forward to your questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for being here and for sharing your story, sharing the journey that your family has been going through and just being so open. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. I also have my oldest daughter, Robin, with me as well. So we are happy to receive your questions. I, um, if I may, Miss Juana, I'd like to start with a question that was placed in the chat. Sure. Um, okay. It was from Miss Mary Dodd. Thank you, Miss Mary Dodd, for um, your interaction throughout the presentation and for your question, which reads, what tips or advice do you have for teachers who have neurodiverse students in their classrooms? Mm. And I was just like, 
I'm just going to go ahead and answer that one live because that is a loaded question and an excellent one. And if I may say, um, all teachers have neurodiverse students in their class. So I, I don't want to say that's only certain teachers. Every single teacher fits into that category. And of course, for those who are identified, the teacher will have an IEP that will provide guidance. But as we've discussed during the presentation, so many of our students are unidentified or maybe identified for one situation, but not everything that could be going on as far as neurodiversity is concerned. So my advice would be for every teacher, every individual that works with children, don't become robotic. Now, I do understand that teachers are very limited with their, their time. They have a certain set of objectives and teaks. If you're in Texas, and I assume we all are Texans on the call, but for anyone who may listen outside of Texas, um, those are our specific standards that we follow here. They have these certain things that they have to cover within a certain amount of time, but there has to be flexibility on the part of the teacher there has to be what we call an education differentiation that just takes place naturally within the lesson so my advice and my tip would be to educators don't be discouraged don't be overwhelmed by all of the politics of education go dig back into what brought you into education in the first place which for most of us, I'm an educator. So for most of us, it was our love for children and our desire to help and to impact the future. So remember why you got into the profession and allow that to push you forward as you do your lesson plans. Make sure that differentiation is on point, even if students are not identified as needing more advanced supplementation or even more help for someone who may have special needs where they need that extra help make sure that you're differentiating that will be my advice but as you can see i can talk on and on very very passionate about education oh and someone in the chat said just put aside the lesson plans all together and i kind of agree with that too <laughs> but you know you need a little framework to help you focus on what you're teaching but feel free, I agree with you, Ms. Watts, feel free to just allow yourself to teach within bounds. We don't want people getting fired, <laughs> but um, teach those children with the love and the passion that brought you into the field of education. I hope that answered the question. I see another question in the chat, but if anyone else, um, please raise your hand or unmute because I may not be able to see you, but I'll read the question that I see in the chat and answer it as well. Um, it's from Lady Jane, and she asks, if you have concerns about a child's behavior, how do you navigate getting them checked out? Another excellent question. Specifically, um, and I wish I had more time with you guys, I could talk with you all day about this topic, but specifically because of the disparities and inequities that we see within the realm of neurodiversity, um, a lot of behavior problems become the forefront issue, particularly in marginalized communities. And so this question is so important because behavior concerns they do deserve being looked into deeper because it may not be so much behavior. It could be a neurodiversity need that is being unmet. So the first step, if these behaviors are being displayed in the school setting, and that's what I'm assuming, Lady Jane, please um, correct me if we're talking about a setting outside of school, but if they're being displayed in the school setting, parents, um, guardians, loved ones i would say remain calm don't get defensive but communicate request meetings with principals with counselors and be open share with them that if it's true and i what i'm assuming as well is that 
many parents whose children have difficulties at school, they also have those same difficulties in the home. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have found that it is um, helpful when parents are honest about that. And they say, you know, I noticed this as well. So try to build a partnership with the school. Don't butt heads with the school. Um, and then you guys can work together. So the school, all school districts have licensed psychologists, and that usually is the first step with looking deeper into a possible issue. But then you also can speak to your pediatrician so that we can make sure that there's a well-rounded view and assessment taking place. And never forget that as parents, you are, in my opinion, the most important voice I don't care if these other people have MDs and PhDs, but as a parent, your voice matters. So always make sure that you are present in the conversation and opinions being formed about your child. Hope that helps. How can you get teachers involved in ensuring that students who are neurodiverse get the same quality education as their peers who are not? Another, these are questions that like hit my emotions because I, I believe in, in the issues that you guys are getting at so, so passionately. Um, the best, in my opinion, the best way that you can get teachers to understand is to continue to advocate and be a voice. Continue to highlight your child's strengths um, because oftentimes, particularly with like autism or any, condition that's considered a disability, which is a term that I'm trying to strip away and I like to just say neurodiversity, oftentimes that diagnosis overpowers so much more about the child. So helping teachers to see that your child is more than his or her autism diagnosis, ADHD, you name it, will help the teachers to also broaden their perspectives. Because I do believe that most educators are not trying to have negative thoughts about their students. So, but sometimes you just get out in the rat race and you're just going and going and you're dealing with these behaviors and it just happens because we're human. So we have to become a neutralizer. We have to become the voice that screams for our children that although they may have these challenges, they also have many positive attributes. And I believe that that will help teachers' perspectives to shift. Any other questions? What would you say to parents who believe they can pray away the neurodiversity in their children and refuse medical help? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, and I do understand that in a lot of underrepresented communities that this is an issue. Um, I wish that I had someone from the medical community on the panel with me because I think that the answer to this question actually takes, it, it, it requires, input from both parties. And what I mean is the medical community has to do a lot of work in healing some of the fractures that have taken place because a lot of distrust exists um, amongst certain communities and the medical community due to historical medical abuses and just unfortunate situations that I know I don't have time to go into, but it's very complex why families develop these opinions and feelings and just adverse thoughts towards medical health. So trust has to be reestablished for sure. Um, so I wouldn't want to come down too harshly on families that have these concerns. But what I would want to do is just try to encourage the families that may be feeling a little apprehensive, um, maybe they have a good relationship with their personal pediatrician, but are a little 
leery of the medical system as a whole. So maybe starting with that relationship that is a positive one and seeing what can be built there. But it really has to do with trust. This is what I've noticed just in the families that I have spoken with thus far. Um, and in my research, I would like to see if I can dig a little bit deeper to see what is at the root of the issue that you're bringing forth. Um, and that would help me to answer the question better on how to help families and help them um, be more open to the medical help. So that that's a deep one right there. That's a deep question. I look forward to researching and finding the answers. Okay. Oh, we have Oh, we, yeah. have, we have one more, one more question and it's for Robin, it's for my daughter. So what will you tell other children who have siblings who are neurodiverse? Oh, okay. Good question. What I would say is, you know, be patient with them and spend more time with them. Like, maybe compare differences that you guys have and work with them maybe uh, on that and like show them like <laughs> I don't know how to explain it but like spend time with them you know kind of observe how they do things so yeah that's all I have to say all right, y'all, that's, it has to be our last question. We do have to wrap up, but again, we want to thank you so, so much for answering questions and for your time. You know, we know it takes a lot to talk about personal experiences. So again, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, we want to thank everyone for attending our forum today. Please connect with us at Integral Care here again at the Together We Will Heal forum every third Wednesday of the month at 1.30 p.m. Remember to join our Facebook page and also visit our conference web, website, excuse me, ctaafsc.com. So that's C as in central, T A A F as in family, S as in support, C as in conference.com. The call for papers for the 2022 conference go out next week. And we hope that everyone has a great day today. Thank y'all. Bye. Bye.